Well, we're going to change gears right now to talk about Russia and Ukraine and about fossil fuels. Earlier, I set it up with a story from the AP that mentioned the cities of Odessa, the region of Donbass, the city of Mariupol, the Black Sea, and all that's going to come into play in the the uh, in this um, interview that I'm about to have with Charlotte Dennett. And I'm joined right now by with Charlotte Dennett, Dennett, the author of Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlotte. I, I hope you can hear me okay. You sound great. And if you Good. can hear us, then we're all set. We're uh, all set. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Well, first of all, we should know that there are three pipelines for Russian gas that gets below the Black Sea into Turkey and Bulgaria. So um, to, do, to talk, maybe I'll start this conversation with talking about the relations between Turkey and Russia before about 2013. Uh, the, the relations between Turkey and Russia before 2013? Before uh, the pipeline, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which pipeline are you referring to? Well, so um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that um, the, the relations between Russia and Turkey were not very great, but then then all of a sudden there was this, I think it was, is it the first Gazprom um, that was, sorry, the first Turk stream pipeline that yes. that became, that warmed up the relations between Turkey and Russia, and there was also military deals involved. So what's the connection there between- Well, well you're right. You're right about that. Um, <clears throat> You know, pipelines, I learned through my uh, years of research, play a very important role in power struggles. And I'll talk to about Turkey in a second, but just to sort of lay the context, um, they're, they're very important because the oil has to be distributed. And when you are landlocked, for instance, it's gotta be by pipeline. But the whole issue is, which territory does it pass through? Whose permission do you need to uh, get that pipeline built? Uh, what, what are the transit fees that are gonna be charged to a particular country? And um, what's the overall goal? Uh, so with the question of Turkey, yes. Uh, Turkey envisions itself as a major corridor for, for energy and for pipelines. And so in that respect, uh, because of that ambition, um, you, you're going to have stronger relationships. And, and so, yes, that Turk stream pipeline was built. And um, <clears throat> most people don't even refer to that one. I, I'm glad you did, because that's sort of a, a precedent to uh, Russia being able to um, effectuate tries with other countries to send its, its huge volumes of natural gas. And the way I look at this Ukraine situation, by the way, is simply that this is a battle between two superpowers. Uh, the United States has the largest reserves of natural gas and uh, Ukraine uh, actually has the, lar the second largest reserves of natural gas in Europe. And so, what, what the standoff is, is who's going to supply most of the energy to Europe. And, and the United States has, has tried to prevent this happening. Um, back in 2014, it, um, it, you know, there was this uh, coup actually that happened that was, that was actually caused by uh, the United States. And, and the whole idea is to wean Europe off of Russian natural gas. And Putin doesn't like that, obviously. His whole, his whole military power is based on profits from the sale of natural gas and oil. So I see this as an energy war more than anything else. We can talk about that more, but if, if you look on maps, maps are so important. And by the way, my book, Follow the Pipelines, has 12 pipeline maps in it. And suddenly everything becomes clear to people what these conflicts are all about. 
Yeah, I'll stop there. I sort of expanded on your question. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, and speaking of maps, you know, the I I referred to maps a lot in prep preparing for this interview, uh, especially it, I was kept I kept being drawn to the Black Sea, and that's of course um, uh, Russia is uh, battling Mariu in Mar Mariupol, which is on the Black Sea. I believe Odessa is on the Black Sea, and Snake Island, which we might talk about a little bit later, all on the Black Sea. What is what's the importance of the Black Sea? in two reasons for global um, shipping, I guess, global uh, commerce, but also for what's underneath the waters and underneath the, the, the seabed of the, of the Black Sea. Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, isn't it interesting in this country, um, when, when you watch you know, mainstream media, the major cha TV channels and so on, there's no mention of the fact that the Black Sea is swimming in oil and natural gas. It's got huge deposits in there. And um, by uh, seizing Crimea, for instance, if you look at one of the maps in my book, you'll see that Putin was able, therefore, to get more access to the Black Sea uh, oil and natural gas resources. And then when you look at the map about where uh, where he's focusing his troops, like Mary, Marie Upal, <laughs> Marie, anyway, however you pronounce it, um, it is right there. And uh, it, it's always been a major port for energy. Uh, a little fact that, again, isn't discussed much. And, and, and I should tell people that the reason it isn't discussed is up until the war in Ukraine, um, oil and natural gas was largely censored because they were considered national security issues. And the reason they're natural security, well, the oil itself is hugely important for uh, fueling the military. In fact, the militaries all around the world are the biggest consumers of oil. And as long as we have them dependent on oil, we're gonna have conflicts uh, because yeah, if you're if you want superpower status or major power, you have to secure oil. And and what's happened in Ukraine? First of all, we remember that right before the right after the the initial invasion, that some of those um, convoys of Russian tanks were stalled because they ran out of gas. I I was surprised by that because um, Russia has plenty of it. Uh, but I don't know, maybe a refinery was bombed or something. They ran out of gas. And that's what they, they are always concerned about. Um, anyway, the Black Sea is very crucial and has long been known to hold these reserves. And so also the Caspian Sea, I might say, which is to the east of the Black Sea, is, is another place rich in oil and natural gas. And it was the pipeline connected to to the Caspian Sea uh, that uh, was to be built crossing Afghanistan, and it still hasn't happened because of conflicts there. Our guest is Charlotte Dennett, the author of Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. I'm Sean Canan, and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe on 88.5. It's 1026 in the morning. Uh, a moment ago, uh, we we talked about the importance of geopolitics and oil and uh, and natural gas. Of course, in in that context, Putin, after the invasion, announced that Russia would only sell its natural gas to what he called unfriendly countries, and we're going to find out what that means. And only, or or maybe he didn't say that, but only to what are called unfriendly countries, and only in Russian rubles. He would not accept dollars or euros. What is the importance of all of that? Well, the reserve currency is very important. And uh, the United States up until fairly recently has always had the, um, the edge on any other uh, currency, in other words, petrodollars. So um, they're all linked. How, how you pay for the oil and gas, uh, whether it's in dollars or rubles, obviously Putin wants rubles, all right? And he's gonna do everything he can um, to make unfriendly countries like Bulgaria and Poland, for instance, he wants them to, to um, buy in in rubles. Now, I, I heard that they were resisting that and that they may be getting their natural gas from somebody else. I'm not, so I'm not sure that actually went through, but clearly that's what he wants to do. Um, he, 
Putin does not accept uh, US dominance of the world, uh, global dominance. And so this horrendous war is part of that, part of his effort to uh, challenge uh, US dominance and to um, make Russia great again, so to speak. Uh, sort of the, the good old days of the Soviet Union. That's what he's trying to do. It, it's really, I find it terribly tragic and, and hugely dangerous, this, this war that's going on. And, and the problem is that because it's largely over access to energy, I don't see it ending soon. I see it just, you know, who's going to win out in the end? And um, I don't know how long this is going to be with us. I'm worried about it escalating. And, you know, they don't say this is about oil because who wants to surrender their boys to a war over oil? It's always been that situation. They've always kept that out of the uh, public explanation, whether it's uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, those are all pipeline wars, as I point out in my book. And now we have Ukraine. And the interesting thing about Ukraine is they can't hide it anymore. It's so obvious. You know, as soon as this war started, I thought, hmm, what's this about? And bingo, the first sanctions that were uh, done against Russia was the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that, that has been completed, running from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany. It was supposed to go online this summer, but the West, uh, primarily U.S., stopped that from happening. So um, you can see that this is largely an energy war besides a war for territory. All of Eastern Ukraine, that's where most of the oil is. So no wonder Putin is focusing on occupying Eastern Ukraine and the US is trying to prevent it because they had major US oil companies in there. Um, some of them have withdrawn. I believe Exxon Mobil has withdrawn because of the war. In the eastern Ukraine, that's the Donbass region. Donbass region, all of that, sure. And so yep. that's where a lot of Ukraine's oil and gas is. I want to remind people that you're that we're speaking with Charlotte Dennett, the author of Follow the Pipelines, and you're talking about how the Ukraine and Russia conflict here, how much of it is is uh, due to fossil fuels. The Brookings Institute has called has said Russia is to natural gas what Saudi Arabia is to oil. So if all these Eastern European countries are reliant on Soviet, on, on Russian gas, that is, if Europe does indeed try to wean itself off gas and pursues things like net zero emissions, um, what will happen to Russia's importance or, or the value? What is Russia's in, um, importance? How is Russia in, involved in keeping that from happening and making sure that they're always going to be dependent on Russian natural gas? Well, for one thing, uh, Putin, He's a, he's a master of the great game, you know, XKGB. So, uh, and he knows how to play the game. And I would argue that up until now, um, he, he was very clever and he won out. He keeps looking for new pipeline routes to circumvent uh, the, uh, the West efforts to, to get more support. Um, he's gonna continue doing that and um, that's the game that's that, that's going on now. So he he wants to he surely wants to s secure uh, Eastern Ukraine. Who knows? He may be building more pipelines through there. Um, but what's happening is that um, <clears throat> you will see that Russian pipelines traverse Ukraine, and Ukraine was getting uh, sizable transit fees out of that millions of dollars worth. And so um, now, because of the war, uh, I believe the natural gas is still going through there, but at any time, uh, Putin could stop it. So there's, there's a mad scramble going on right now. And, and it's really funny, the US is turning to its enemies, like, like Venezuela, right? Oh, please put out more oil and natural gas. And they're balking, Saudi Arabia, is balking. Why is Saudi Arabia balking? Because it's got good relations with Russia. This, this is a quandary for the United States. And, and the other quandary is he's, uh, Biden has called on, um, called on American domestic suppliers of oil and gas 
to pump out more. And he's he's even uh, now allowing uh, uh, drilling and leased, leased federal lands. The problem for him is that some of these oil companies, they don't want to pump more because they're making lots of profits right now with the shortage or the scramble. Uh, the profits are doing beautifully. If, if they start doing more drilling uh, to increase the output, it may lower their profits. So you, he, Biden's got that dilemma as well. It's most of Europe is really worried about how this whole thing is going to end up, uh, primarily because of their energy supplies. Like Germany was trying to wean itself totally off of nuclear power. And this Nord Stream pipeline was going to be its savior. So now they're trying to build uh, terminal points in Europe, including in Germany, to receive American natural gas. And, and the frack gas industry is making out like bandits right now. So they're trying to supply um, the European continent with more natural gas, but they have to build more terminals because they don't have enough uh, to receive these large LNG uh, tankers. So the energy markets are really in flux and you know, it's very hard to predict what, what ultimately is going to happen. The Our fact is people are doing well, they're doing great, but some of the majors don't want to drill more. It's all about Our the price of oil. Our guest is Charlotte Dennett, the author of Follow the Pipelines. We're talking about how fossil fuels are uh, kind of leading the way when it comes to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And Charlotte, a moment ago, you were talking about drilling in the United States. And so I want to read this uh, short headline that, that is happening today in New Orleans. A federal appeals court will hear arguments today about whether President Biden legally suspended new oil and gas lease sales because of climate change worries. The case has not been tried, but a federal judge blocked the order saying, only Congress could suspend the sales. Federal lawyers say the government has broad power to hold, cancel, or defer lease sales. Lawyers for 13 states say a law covering oil and gas leases requires the sales. After the judge in Northeast Louisiana ruled for the states, the Interior Department held an offshore lease sale, but a federal judge in Washington then canceled it. Four onshore lease sales are scheduled in June. So none of this is directly related to the war between Russia and Ukraine, but I guess it all kind of gets to the idea of are global economies going to wean themselves off of oil and natural gas or are and go toward more toward um, non fossil fuel sources of energy or is oil just kind of uh, a natural part of our energy mix and it's going to be here for the f remaining future. Uh, any thoughts about that, and especially when it comes to the the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? It's all part. It's all part of the same system. And, um, you know, what I've been reading is that in Europe, there is intense efforts, even more intense efforts to wean themselves off of oil and natural gas. Whereas in the United States, the opposite is happening. It is drill baby drill again, in some cases. Um, I would also say that you have to make a, a distinction between the independents, the smaller oil and natural gas companies, which are um, the frack gas industry, which happen to be the major support behind Trump, by the way. Uh, and, and so they, they're definitely trying to capitalize on this. And there's talk about, you know, climate, climate change. Yeah, maybe, but you know, this is the real world. And uh, you, 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 gotta, you gotta be practical about this, namely drill, baby, drill. Uh, climate activists are very alarmed about this in the, in the United States. And so some of them are saying, no, we're still gonna renew our efforts to, find an alternative but what what i've been reading is it's not that easy in other words even with uh solar and sun uh ramping up uh it's not going to meet all the immediate energy needs in the, in the near future so again it's all up for grabs but but you can be sure that it's all interrelated the other aspect besides petrodollars and energy supplies is the military. What I discovered is that with pipelines, um, you have to have them protected militarily. And that also explains a lot about these endless wars that we've been in Afghanistan and Iraq, 
are both pipeline wars and huge amounts of military. See that all that military being sent into Ukraine. I, I would wager that it's not just to support Ukraine as it's fighting the Russians. I would wager that so those supplies are going to be there and they're going to end up being protecting who knows what, uh, but it will be energy routes as well. It's all interconnected. Our guest is Charlotte Dennett, author of Follow the Pipelines. We're talking about how fossil fuels are a driver between the Russia-Ukraine war that's happening right now. And Charlotte, do you feel like t taking a phone call from one of our listeners? Of, of course. Okay, sounds great. Uh, let's go right now to Jeff in Plant City. Hi, Jeff. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I have always been very frustrated by the, the way oil is priced, and it, it could be for lack of knowledge, but it seems to me that when the price of oil, or say specifically even gasoline, when it falls, it falls on real information, uh, excess production, uh, excess inventory, uh, pandemic, you know, nobody's buying it, uh, which I guess is the basis of our whole economy. But when oil rises, it seems to rise on speculation, which to me, uh, another word for speculation would be imagination. I mean, are, are the, you know, the speculators saying worst case scenario, you know, we, we could be out of oil or something like that, you know, so it goes up. Uh, you know, am I missing something here? Or is, is, that just seems like profiteering to me. Thank you for the question, Jeff. Let's see what Charlotte has to say about oh, that. You're right. You're right on. Of course, they're, they're going to try to exploit this as much as they can. And so, um, for instance, I don't know how much the uh, cost of gasoline is in your area Flor or Florida. Where, what's it running by? I know in California, it's 6 to $7 a gallon. Yeah, right now, um, it's, it's a little bit more than... Um... I think it's a little bit more than four dollars a gallon. So between huh. about four fifteen and four thirty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's what it is in Vermont where I live. But you will find places where that they, they are artificially raising the prices, and there's efforts to stop. There are investigations going on right now uh, uh, with regard to price fixing. I don't know how successful they will be, but yes, they're and and you know they say that they're they're responding to their their stockholders. You know, the people who have stock, they, they love it. They, yeah, keep keep it up, you know, but most of us suffer as a result of it. And that that makes it very difficult, for instance, you know, for the for the Biden administration. Um, there's there's only so much he can do. He's trying, but um the the odds are that um he can only do so much. And and we're going to be stuck with these high gasoline prices for some time, I believe, which is hurting all of us. <laughs> we're speaking with Charlotte Dennett, author of Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. This is WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canan, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. And we have an email question in here from Jeff. Um, maybe it's the same Jeff. Uh, I don't know but maybe it's not. So it says, Jeff says, I've noticed that some big oil and gas companies such as ExxonMobil, Marathon, Valero, et cetera, have increased in value over the last months. Are those companies somehow benefiting from the war? I would say, yes, they are. I mean, oil, all oil companies are, are benefiting from this war. And uh, that's been well documented. They're, they're, and the, the interesting thing is that you know, two years ago, they were almost going bankrupt because of COVID. It, yeah, the, it was just fascinating. In the beginning no one, of the, sorry to interrupt ahead. you, Charlotte, but in the beginning of the pandemic, the price of gas was, it hit zero and, or not gas, but the price of oil on the world market hit zero and then actually went to negatives. You had, they were for a very short time, they were paying people to take oil from, yeah. from you. It's just, just incredible. So now all those, um, misfortunes have been reversed and their profits are higher than they have they've ever been charlotte dennett is author of follow the pipelines uncovering the mystery of a lost spy and the deadly politics of the great game for oil and you're listening to wmnf tampa we have rob in thanota sasa on the line rob what would you like to ask 
Hi. Um, I was curious whether your guest, uh, how rational your guest believes Putin is, and um, if, if he considers this battle over energy to be for Russia in, uh, an existential problem. And, and if the Russian military proves to be unable to dominate Ukraine, whether or not he could uh, decide to try to play brinksmanship with, by using maybe tactical nukes or something in order to, uh, to gain an advantage. All right. Thank you for the question, Rob. Um, that's the great unknown. Uh, we don't know. I mean, for instance, there was much speculation that, that Putin was going to formally declare war. Uh, and that would have been brought in more conscripts into the battle. And everyone was surprised when the, the major uh, May 5th celebration for the victory over Nazi Germany in 45, that major celebration was subdued and there was not a call for conscripts. And, and there's thinking that the reason is because if there were, that would indicate to the Russian people that the war is not going well. And um, so, you know, they make predictions and you can't be sure. You, there is good intelligence, pretty good intelligence, it would seem. And the U.S. seems to be doing, uh, U.S. and its NATO allies seem to be doing quite well in blunting uh, Putin's advance. Uh, I think the hope is that there's going to be a, a regime change. That's clearly even even Biden. I mean, uh, Biden sort of let it slip that um, he shouldn't be in power. Putin knows this. He knows that that they would like to get rid of him. So he's a wily guy. I would never underestimate him. Um, with, but honestly, I can't predict what he's going to do next. Well, thank you for that question, Rob. Anything else? Yeah, really quickly, and I'll take your answer off the off the air off the air on the air that uh, you know nuclear power is a very controversial uh, issue, but it seems to me that um, this reliance on petrochemicals is very uh, it's it's causing all this these problems, and even though nuclear power has its own you know with nuclear waste and so on, but still it is clean energy. And it also is, uh, it will reduce our dependence um, because, you know, right now, green energy is not productive enough to replace, you know, oil. So how about uh, a chance that nuclear energy could uh, sort of defuse these situations? Thank you for the question, Rob. I, that is a good question. And as I've been appearing on shows, I've, I've been getting reactions from different um different sectors of the energy um, infrastructure. And yeah, I, some people are saying this is a time for people to look again at nuclear and specifically at uh, more advanced nuclear energy. Um, I remain somewhat skeptical. I know there's been efforts in the United States to start some, some new new powers and, and they have not succeeded. They're very expensive for one thing, that's a problem to build these things. The other thing is how do you deal with the waste? The still That still seems to be a problem. And uh, we know that the old reactors uh, emitted um, waste that was dangerous. So I, I don't know if, if, if nuclear power is going to be able to step in and fill the gap. There are efforts, though. There, there are definitely a lot of pro-nuke people out there saying, look at us. We, we've learned our lessons, and we've got uh, better reactors. So we'll just have to watch it. If I could just add something, if I have a couple of minutes, just, just to tell people how I got into this situation. Um, my father was... Um, America's first master spy in the Middle East, Daniel Dennett. And he was sent over there in early 44. Uh, and and um, I was able to, he died in a, in a mysterious plane crash in 47 after a top secret uh, mission to Saudi Arabia. So as an adult, I started investigating his death. And in his case, uh, the mission was to pr protect protect the oil of Saudi Arabia at all costs. That came out of a declassified re uh, record of his because I sued the CIA for information. And uh, it was a Trans-Arabian pipeline that was gonna 
carry that Saudi oil to a terminal point on the Mediterranean, which would either have ended in Lebanon or its next door neighbor, Palestine, which is now Israel. And the more I studied that pipeline and its route, the more I began to understand how, how absolutely critical they are. There, there was one contemporary of my father who called the, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline the artery of empire, that is the American empire in the Middle East, which it certainly was. And then it, it was able to advance uh, the United States into a superpower. It was because of his control of Saudi oil. And even America's own allies were uh, very alarmed by this because like the French and the English controlled the Middle East uh, before World War II. And then along comes this upstart, the United States that gets control of the greatest reserves of uh, oil in, in the world. It was a bonanza. It helped, uh, it helped fuel the Marshall Plan. It helped that Saudi oil. It helped wean Europe off of communist controlled uh, coal, coal mines. And um, that's when the, the, the Cold War really started in 47, around that time, the Truman Doctrine, which was like declared to be a, a basically a, a war on all communist countries, but, it, but what most people don't understand, it was primarily fixated on the Middle East and trying to make sure that the U.S. had control over Greece and Turkey. So anyway, um, that's how I got started, looking at all the incredible intrigues around the, um, the uh, tap line, and then uh, realizing that if I followed the pipeline right up to the present, I would find this common denominator of uh, pipelines are the arteries of empire. They're extremely important political factors. They call it pipeline politics, as a matter of fact. Our guest is Charlotte Dennett, and her book is called Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. And as you just heard, that lost spy that, uh, that Charlotte was talking about was her father, Daniel Dennett, who was uh, in the predecessor to the CIA. So very interesting stuff there. Um, we were talking a moment ago about climate change and about weaning uh, people off of fossil fuels, weaning our society off of fossil fuels. And I want to play some a little bit of audio from Nancy Pelosi. The House Speaker was in Miami Beach yesterday addressing climate activists and that she said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made energy independence more important than ever, the invasion is being funded by European nations that buy oil from Russia. And Pelosi says it's tragic evidence for the need to urgently deal with the causes of climate change. Here's a little bit of what Nancy Pelosi said yesterday in Miami Beach. The fact is that people can't get away with that kind of behavior and they cannot be financed in doing it by our dependence on fossil fuels in their country. And Pelosi also said that she hopes to introduce legislation this week that would hammer Russia with more sanctions. Whether it's humanitarian support, whether it's economic support, whether it's sanctions, 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 or whether it is um, three things, weapons, weapons, and weapons. Is there anything worse for the environment than war? So that was a little bit of what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said yesterday in Miami Beach during the opening session of the Aspen Institute's climate conference. The conference runs through Thursday. So I guess I could put my um, question, my next question to our guest, Charlotte Dennett, author of Follow the Pipelines. Um, what do you think about that, that um, statement there that Nancy Pelosi said that, you know, a lot of things are bad for war, I'm sorry, are bad for the environment, like burning fossil fuels. But another thing that's really bad for war is all the fossil fuels and so on that's burned during a, during a war. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. Uh, and and I might add that, um, you know, President Biden uh, learned about the aftermath of the Iraq war about burn pits and uh, all the uh, used up uh, petrochemicals burned in these pits and other chemicals and the, it caused cancer. And he has definitely attributed the cancer of his son, the brain cancer to the fact that he was stationed over there and uh, 
apparently was around burn pits. I mean, it is very bad. It's very dangerous for the for the environment. So it, it, it's kind of amazing situation they're in. I think Nancy Pelosi uh, really believes that we that we have to uh, find alternative sources of energy. Uh, but at the same time, with this war going on, I, I feel like it's almost beyond her control, frankly. Um, the, the the Biden administration is under huge pressure um, to relax all regulations that would have inhibited building uh, more pipelines. Uh, the XL pipeline, for instance, uh, a lot of pressure to reopen that. And so they're doing two things. They've got to bounce. They've got to sort of. I mean, the Democrats have to say, "Look, we, we still realize it's important to find alternative energy." But at the same time, we have to be practical and we have to supply our allies. So I don't know how it's all going to end up. Hopefully not in nuclear war. But, you know, there's triggers. A, a stupid thing could happen and spark a whole World War, just like happened in World War I. I compare it more to World War I than World War II. You know, entangling alliances, they're happening right now. And everyone's getting set. So if there's a World War... I don't know. Hold on to your seat. Our guest Hopefully is, not nuclear. Yeah, our guest is Charlotte Dennett, the author of Follow the Pipelines, and you're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. Jennifer has been holding for a while in Spring Hill. She wanted to respond to the gentleman who suggested that nuclear power plants were an option. So hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, yeah, I think the thing, the, the natural tendency is to like scramble for something and we feel like, oh, maybe that's familiar. And, you know, people just don't realize that the largest nuclear reactor is 93 million miles away and it's the best one. It's the sun and the solar energy works, <laughs> you know, and it's just, but people are afraid to do that. I mean, look at, look at the Philippines. They've just elected, you know, Marcos, the sun. I mean, they're a dictator. So people are, they go for something familiar and they're afraid to try something new. I have solar panels in my house, my get, or my, bill is only because it's tied to the grid i pay like 35 bucks a month for my you know electricity with air conditioning and run a pool also you know so th the point is that it, it does work but there's all these people that say, oh it's not really strong enough because florida power wanted to you know control that and so like, and rather than letting people have the off the grid which i can't be but i generate my own electricity but the thing is and i have to go back to the grid but i have to stay tied to it so they want everybody to have that centralized energy so they can make money. And that's why they put that bill up there. And Wilton Simpson pushed for that bill. And I'll, I'll give DeSantis credit that he vetoed it because it does hurt people that are putting solar panels on their house. And it does help. Solar makes a big difference. And that eases the, the need for coal and for other dirty energies, you know, oils and gas and things. So that's the thing. I, I hope... I have to say, first time I really agreed with Nancy Pelosi in a long time, and I hope she's sincere about it because, yeah, war fuels this, and it just energy wars just keep us in the same old, you know, spiral. And we need to just stop thinking about the usual and start realizing that these other things work just as well, <laughs> so or better, because there's no you you know a bad day with solar like a solar energy spill would be a beautiful day like today. So. <laughs> You thank, know, that's, th that's something that we just got to keep in mind. Thank you for your that's call, Jennifer. Great. Let's get our re reaction from our guest, Charlotte Dennett, author of Follow the Pipelines. Bravo to you. Bravo to you for, for doing the solar panels. And, uh, you know, the day will come, I believe, where we are going to be able to rely on solar and wind. Uh, but there are problems, for instance, like Vermont. There's not enough sunshine. I mean, we have, we have uh, solar panels up here. But there, there are cloudy days that are of concern. I think, I think the technology is, is uh, preparing for those eventualities or no wind, for instance. That, that's the funny thing. It's like you need to be assured that you've got enough energy. And if you have uh, uh, calm days or cloudy days or so on, uh, somehow that's got to be factored in. Now, you, you living in Florida, I don't think you have that problem. And uh, so, yeah, but, but the energy companies themselves really want people to be dependent on them. That's how it works. And they're very powerful, as we know. 
Uh, they got a lot of money. Uh, I was just covering a, uh, a primary race in California by a Democrat uh, running against uh, two other Democrats, both who are very heavily dependent on oil, oil money for their campaigns. And money talked, you know? So it's gonna be an interesting battle for quite a long time to come. I and by the way, I would, I, I would just add that, you know, the, the brutality of Putin's war in, in Ukraine um, has to be looked at in context. Part of it, I believe, is humiliation. Uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a hugely um, humiliating factor for Russian leaders, even the people themselves, I think. And, and one of the factors that, that really annoys them is that when that happened in 1992, uh, the United States pledged that they would not move any farther east towards Russian borders. And what they did is they continually violated that. So what you have is uh, a leader who uh, wants to end the humiliation. And when did, when did that happen before? Hitler, you know, Hitler was humiliated by German losses in World War I, by the way, because they ran out of gas, okay? He was humiliated by it. And so that's what it does. I mean, these, these energy wars create these dictators who are desperate. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I want to thank so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Charlotte. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Charlotte Dennett is the author of Follow the Pipelines, Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. And you're listening to WMNF Tampa. 